history theory. This is an ASMR channel. So if you do not like ASMR, you're wondering why I'm whispering. And if this video is going to be whisper from start to finish, yes, it will be. And if you do not care for it, I have a podcast that talks about true crime, conspiracy theories, and stuff like that. So I would invite you to head that way. I will have links in the comments and also in the description box down below. Now, today's case is on Amelia Earhart, and um, I am pretty sure that most of you know who she was and what she is very well known for, which is attempting to go around the world in a plane. A long time ago, she was the first woman to attempt it, and she was very, I don't know, she, she, she had a strong will. Maybe she was a little strong-headed, but she wanted to do this trip around the world by the equator, or really close to the equator, so she could do it the longest. There, there was some men that did it before her, but she wanted to do it in a different way and go through, or somewhat close to the equator to even make more miles. There's a lot of conspiracy theories because, of course, she disappeared. And I will cover the conspiracy theories in my next video. However, in this one, I will tell you the untold story of Amelia Earhart. I feel like we all know how her life, quote-unquote, ended. And uh, what people have been saying about what about her life? I mean, she was born in 1897 and she had this dream that I am sure that had a lot to do with her parents, how she was raised and, and a lot of details that will make her into what she became. The very well-known Amelia Earhart. And I think that while I'm going through today's story, there is always a lesson to be learned and the responsibility as parents to help our kids to dream big, even if we didn't. I understand that uh, sometimes we limit ourselves, but I hope that we can all take out of this story that it doesn't matter the kind of life you have. You can always help your kids or those kids that you can have an influence on and make them believe they can and more than likely they will. It's all about letting them dream and uh, give them the possibility, you know, that it's something that they can do. So I'm going to tell you her untold story, quote unquote, which is more about how she started and how she became who she was. She was born in Atchison, Kansas on July 24th, 1897 in the home of her maternal grandfather. His name was Alfred Gideon Otis, who was a former federal judge, the president of the Atchison Savings Bank, and a respected citizen in their town. Uh, her parents, uh, oh, Amelia, Amelia's parents, I should say, were Samuel Edwin Stanton Earhart and Amelia or Amy Otis. Amelia was the second child of the marriage, but the first child died as a baby. I think it was stillborn in 1896. She was part of a German descent, Alfred, her grandfather, uh, maternal grandfather, I should clarify, didn't approve of Amy's and Edwin's marriage. He was basically against it, and he was more than likely not agreeing with their relationship because he was, according to what I read, dissatisfied with Edwin's progress as a lawyer. 
mom as Amy because otherwise it's going to take me forever to go through all their names and last names. Now, from an early age, Amelia was a leader, while her sister, she had a younger sister, Grace, who was two years younger than her, was mostly a follower. Amelia was nicknamed Millie, and Grace was Bitch. Both girls, and, um, and there are some occasions where they refer them as Millie and Bitch instead of Amelia and Grace. They were raised in a very unconventional way since Amy, uh, their mother, didn't believe in molding her children into nice little girls, quote unquote. Or, again, quote, proper little girls. Amy's mother, Amelia's grandmother, disapproved of the bloomers worn by Amy's children. Bloomers were those kinds of kind of feminine shorts that they were used at the time for athletic reasons. Um, let's say if they were just going to ride a bike or something, the dress wasn't going to be um, appropriate for riding a bike, so they would use that. However, the girls were using this kind of bloomers uh, on an everyday basis and they loved it because it gave them a lot more freedom to do other things more athletic or more physical things without having to be careful with their dresses but both of the girls knew and they were very aware that other girls in the neighborhood did not wear them so I guess that they kind of knew that they were different or that didn't stop them from using them or having fun in them. Both of the girls had a spirit of adventure in them, so they will venture out in their neighborhood to explore around. They spent hours playing together, and some of their adventures included climbing trees, of course, hunting rats with a rifle, and belly slamming their sleds downhill. Fun times. <laughs> and even though it wasn't uncommon for kids to play like this, Amelia was undoubtedly a tomboy. Or they would uh, say that <laughs> people in town. She always liked to experiment and take things to the next level, almost fearless. I would say fearless. Uh, she I think that's one of the words that can describe Amelia the best. In 1904, with the help of her uncle, she made a ramp. She wanted to look and act like a roller coaster she saw in one of the road trips that she took with her parents. So she secured the ramp to the roof of the tool shed and she wanted to use it to slide and almost fly from the roof down. Needless to say, she ended up with a broken wooden box a bruised lip, torn dress, and a sensation of acceleration that she described to her sister as, and I'm going to quote her, Oh, bitch, it's just like flying. Again, a fearless little girl that was raised to believe in herself and tried to be different. Uh, this time, it, it was a very dangerous thing, though, but that she tell you how she was always thinking out of the box. In 1907, Edwin, Amelia's dad, was working as a claims officer for the Rock Island Railroad, and he was being transferred to Iowa. When Amelia was 10 years old, her dad took the girls to the state fair in Iowa as a trip, because they had to stay behind, and I'll talk about that in just a few minutes. And the dad was trying to interest them in taking a flight, so he showed them an aircraft. The girls looked at it and wanted to go back to the merry-go-round, not paying much attention to it. But later, Amelia described the big plane as a, and I'm going to quote her, a thing of rusty wire and wood, and not at all interesting. However, while her parents left and moved to a new, smaller house in Iowa, the girls stayed behind, as I mentioned. 
mentioned before, and we're being homeschooled, and uh, it was the grandmother and somebody else that was homeschooling from the society, somebody from the high society of the town, and they described Amelia as exceedingly fond of reading. Later, when the parents settled in 1909, they got reunited in Iowa, and Amelia started the seventh grade in a public school. When they first got reunited, things improved for them, money-wise, of course, but Edwin, which, again, Amelia's dad, was an alcoholic at this point, and five years later, after they moved, he was forced to retire. He then looked for help trying to stop his drinking habit. At around that time, Amelia, um, Amelia Otis, which was Amelia's grandmother on the mother's side, died suddenly, and even though she had a substantial estate ready for her daughter, Amelia's mom, she put it in a trust fund kind of uh, thing. I, I read about it, but I didn't completely understand what I got out of it is it was some kind of a trust mind fund kind of thing because she was afraid that Edwin will spend the money drinking um, the house where she lived uh, was auctioned and everything in it and later on Amelia said that this was officially what ended her childhood so she was going through all this turmoil of her father being an alcoholic and trying to recover her grandma dying at the same time and remember that this is the grandma that homeschool her that stay with her behind while her parents were at this new place in Iowa uh, settling down in 1915 after a long search our, uh, Amelia's father found work as a clerk at the Great Northern Railway in, Railway in St. Paul Minnesota, where Amelia entered Central High School as a junior. I feel for her. I mean, she had to move so much from one place to the other. In 1915, Edwin, Amelia's dad, applied for a transfer to Springfield, Missouri, but the current claims officer reconsidered his retirement and demanded his job back, leaving the elder Earhart with nowhere to go. Again, facing another bad move, Amy, um, Amelia's mom, took her children to Chicago where they started living with some friends. I am pretty sure that by this time she was pretty fed up with uh, the alcoholic husband and him not being reliable or responsible for uh, keeping a job and her with uh, teenage girls going to school. Amelia decided to look for the nearest high schools in Chicago with the best science program, and she was very picky about it, but she eventually enrolled in Hyde Park High School, but spent a miserable semester that year. The year's uh, yearbook caption read, A.E. Amelia Earhart, the girl in brown who walks alone. That was, that was pretty cool. However, she managed to graduate from Chicago's Hyde Park High School in 1916. Remember that she started her junior year back uh, where she was living with her dad and then they moved here. Throughout her traveled childhood, she had uh, continued to aspire to a future career. She kept a scrapbook of newspaper clippings about successful women in the back. Uh, then, in the back then, uh, male-oriented fields like the film industry, production, law, advertising, management, and mechanical engineer. She began junior college at Auckland's school in Rydal, Pennsylvania, or Rydal, Pennsylvania, but did not complete her program. During Christmas vacation in 1917, Amelia visited her sister, that I'm sure that by this time she has grown up and, you know, moving on with her life. And uh, she was visiting her sister in Toronto. And the World War I had been raging, and Amelia saw all the returning wounded soldiers. Uh, I am sure that her sister was somehow involved with this. So she decided that she wanted to help. So after receiving training as a nurse's, um, nurse aide from the Red Cross 
Aviation that accompanied early aviation training, which I'm sure that it's pretty different from what we have as training today. She chose a leather jacket, and if you've ever seen a picture of her, you've probably seen her in the leather jacket, but she was aware that other aviators would be judging her, so she decided to sleep in it for three nights to give that jacket a worn look so it wouldn't look new. <laughs> to complete her image transformation, she also cropped her hair short in the style of other female flyers. So even though she was different, and even though she wanted to do different things, bigger things, even bigger things than men, she knew that she had to fit in. I guess that's what she was doing by changing her appearance a little bit. Six months later, Amelia purchased a second-hand bright yellow Kinner Airster by a plane that she nicknamed the Cannery. Of course, it was bright yellow. <laughs> On October 22, 1922, Amelia flew the Airster to an altitude of 14,000 feet, which is about 4,300 meters, setting a world record for a female pilot. I mean, she <laughs> quickly learned how to get around. <laughs> On May 15, 1923, Amelia became the 16th woman in the United States to be issued a pilot's license, which I'm sure that made her very proud. But that was only the first step. Throughout the early 1920s, after some bad invest investments, Amelia's inheritance from her grandmother, which was managed by her mother, decreased until it was completely gone. Because of that, Amelia decided to sell the cannery as well as a second kinner and bought a yellow kissel, which was a two-passenger car that she named the Yellow Peril. In 1924, Amelia's parents got divorced, so she decided to drive her mother in the Yellow Peril on a trip from California with uh, stops throughout the West and even a uh, jaunt up to uh, Alberta in Canada. The tour ended in Boston, Massachusetts, where Amelia had another sinus operation. This was something that they talk extensively in different versions that I read about her story. I mean, they all say the same thing, but they, uh, some of them have a lot of details. Now, she got sick. She was really sick uh, after the war, after she came back from helping in the war. Um, recovery effort, you know, helping the soldiers and stuff. And uh, when she, she was left after uh, being sick, was it? A sinus problem, so every once in a while she would have to go back and get some kind of uh, surgery. After she got better, she went back to Columbia University, but she had to drop out because her mother, after everything that happened with the money, could not longer afford the tuition and fees. Soon after, she got a job as a teacher and then as a social worker, and she lived in the Medford area in Massachusetts. She never lost her passion for flying. So while she was there, she became a member of the American Aeronautical Society of Boston and was eventually elected as a vice president. So even though she didn't have her plane, even though that was her passion, she knew it was on hold. It wasn't gone, but it was on hold. She flew out of Denson Airport um, that later was the night Naval Air Station is Quantum in Quincy, Massachusetts, and helped finance its operation by investing a small sum of money. Amelia also flew the first official flight out of Denison Airport in 1927. But on top of the that, she also was also a sales representative for a Kinner Aircraft in the Boston area. She wrote local newspaper columns promoting flying, and as her popularity grew, she started an organization devo devoted to female flyers. So I believe that even though, again, she wasn't really involved, or she wasn't really flying, she was still in trying to stay in the business. 
business and trying to find her way into it. I don't know if she actually planned it, but after everything that you can read about this a woman, I mean, you can tell that she never gave up, and which is something that I think it kind of makes it or breaks it, because some other people in that situation where they had to sell everything, they came from a wealthy family, they had everything that they needed, they were, you know, fearless, and then all of a sudden they are losing everything, they had to sell their planes, and I, I just feel like she never gave up, and that's why everything started to happen at this point, when in 1927, Charles Lindbergh flew solo across the Atlantic. So, Amy Katz, which is another female pilot, decided that she would like to be the first woman to fly across the Atlantic Ocean. She later decided that it was too much for her to undertake, so she took a step back and decided to sponsor the project as long as they could find another girl with the right image. In, 19, in April 1928, Amelia got a phone call from Captain Rayleigh that offered her to be the first woman to fly the Atlantic, but with a catch, in my opinion, because she wasn't going to be the pilot. Wilmer Stoltz was going to be, uh, who was going to pilot the plane. Louis Gordon uh, was going to be the co-pilot mechanic, keeping the log and her basically a passenger. She, again, never gave up, so she, of course, accepted, even though that wasn't exactly what she wanted. But they departed on June 17, 1928, and they were flying for 20 hours and 40 minutes that, land, that actually landed in South Wales. They caught a plague at the site, and it was, in fact, an achievement, but Amelia wasn't happy with it, and she said that she was only a package like a sack of potatoes and that she wanted to do it by herself in the future. So, <laughs> even though she did take the opportunity to be in the record and to be flying and to be where she wanted to be, she still managed to let everyone know that she wasn't 100% happy with it. Now, Amelia and the crew received a wonderful welcome back on June 19, 1928, when she landed in uh, Southampton, England. Uh, she flew the April Avian 594 Avian 3rd, owned by Lady Mary Heath, and later purchased the aircraft there and had it shipped back to the United States. So, it's it's funny because, again, while they were in this trip, she also managed to buy a plane and get it shipped back to the U.S. When they came back to the United States, they had a big welcome back reception, and uh, in, along with the canyon of heroes in Manhattan, um, they even went to the White House. I mean, it was a big, big, big event. And at that time, she became a public figure and had a lot of contracts to promote and advertise different brands. Some of them were cigarettes, woman uh, clothes, and stuff like that. Her image sold. I mean, she became the first woman to do something like this, even though she wasn't the pilot. That was a big for that time. And she started to do a little bit of marketing with these companies, she became what uh, would be considered today a modern-day celebrity. Shortly after her return, um, she set off on her first solo flight. And in August 1928, Amelia became the first woman to fly solo across the North American continent and back. Her piloting skills and professionalism gradually grew as acknowledged by experienced professional pilots who flew with her. In 1929, she made her first attempt at competitive air racing during the first Santa Monica to Cleveland Women's Air Derby, which left Santa Monica on August 18 and arrived at Cleveland on August 26. During this race, she got into fourth place in the heavy planes division. Her friend, Ruth Nichols, who 
was coming third, had an accident. Apparently, her aircraft hit a tractor at the start of the runway in one of the stops that they did and flipped over, so kind of forced her out of the race. Because of that, Amelia was placed third in the heavy division. <laughs> she, I read also about this. Um, apparently, she didn't have quite the power that the other contestants had in their planes. I have no idea about planes. I really don't know anything about them. But uh, according to the research that I did, she could have done better if she had a different plane. That's all I could get out of that information. In 1931, Amelia set a world altitude record of 18,415 feet, which is 5,613 meters. Amelia was adventurous, of course, and engaged in a lot of flying stunts at the time, but she was also involved with other females fl female flyers who were trying to make the American public open to the idea that aviation was no longer a man's kind of thing, and that a woman proved this time and time again that they could do it with all these records to prove it. During this period, Amelia became involved with the 99s, which is an organization of female pilots providing moral support and, uh, and advancing the cause of women in or women in aviation. She later became the organization's first president in 1930. In 1934, the Bendix Trophy race banned women. <laughs> of course, because they were doing so much, they decided to, you're not allowed. So as a protest, uh, she openly refused to fly the screen actress Mary Pickford to Cleveland to open the races. It wasn't fair, and they knew it. So, <laughs> again, she was pretty sassy and a little bit. I, and I wonder, you're going to ban women from this race, but you still want a, women, a woman to open the race for you, and you want another woman to fly her there. <laughs> what? Doesn't make sense. While all this was going on, on uh, the still, <laughs> I mean, she had a lot going on, as you can tell, but she somehow still found time to for love, and she was engaged to Samuel Chapman. He was a chemical engineer from Boston, but on November 23rd, 1928, she decided to break off the engagement. Now, why? Are you wondering? Well, a lot of people say that during that uh, same period of time, she broke it off, that, you know, she broke, uh, broke up with him. She was also spending a lot of time with her publisher, George P. Putnam. And I'm going to call him GP, <laughs> because that's how most people knew him. And he, this guy, GP, was a divorced man that was in love with a male. And after Amelia broke it off with her, uh, the engagement with uh, Samuel, he, this guy, GP, decided to propose to her in six different occasions, and he kept trying until Amelia said yes. <laughs> I don't know, I think something happened with Samuel, because... I don't understand, but we're going to talk about a little bit more what you believe marriage were, it was in just a minute. After substantial hesitation on her part, they married on February 7, 1931, in GP's mother, uh, mother's house in uh, Noank, Connecticut. Amelia referred to her marriage as a partnership, quote-unquote, with dual control, quote-unquote. Amelia's ideas on marriage were liberal for the time, as she believed in equal responsibility for both breadwinners, and pointedly kept her own name rather than being referred to as Mrs. Putnam. And she even had a few encounters with the media trying to call her that. <laughs> they even 
say that the media even said that um, GP knew that he was going to be Mr. Earhart instead of Mr. Putnam, Putnam when he got married to her. In a letter uh, written to GP and hand delivered to him on the day of the wedding, she wrote, I want you to understand I shall not hold you to any medium medieval code of fa faithfulness to me, nor shall I consider myself bound to you similarly. I guess she didn't believe in marriage. That's why she's trying to say with this note. Okay, sharing the responsibilities. I am in the same boat. Both working great. If you agree to that, and if you have the time, great. But what I do not understand is this, that it was like an open marriage. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. Again, she was ahead of her time. There was no honeymoon for the newlyweds, as Amelia was involved in a nine-day cross-country tour. And this was with a sponsor, Beach Nut Chewing Gum. Although Amelia and JP never had children, JP had two sons with his previous marriage to Dorothy Benny. She, um, you know, Dor Dorothy, which is um, the ex-wife of JP. Uh, her parents, I think her dad invented Crayola crayons. <laughs> I just thought it was interesting. And um, with Dorothy GP had uh, two kids, David, Benny, and George uh, Palmer, Putnam. Um, and um, Amelia was especially fond of David, who frequently visited his father at their family home, which was one on, on, on the grounds of the Apawamis Club in Rye, New York. Not sure what that club is, but <laughs> hopefully I didn't butcher it. George had contracted polio shortly after his parents' separation and was unable to visit as often, so she did have some kind of a relationship with both of the boys, but mostly David, who was the one that visited the most. I'm assuming that they were older at the time. On the morning of May 20th, 1932, 34-year-old Amelia set off from Harbor Grace, Newfoundland with a copy of the Telegraph Journal given to her by journalist Stuart Truman, and it was intended to confirm the date of the flight. She intended to fly to Paris in her single-engine Lockheed Vega 5B to emulate Charles Lindbergh, remember? The solo flight he did five years earlier, while well, she wanted uh, to do it herself. Her technical advisor for the flight was uh, famed Norwegian American aviator Bern Bolchen, who helped uh, prepare her aircraft for that long trip. After a flight lasting 14 hours 56 minutes, during which she contended with a strong northerly winds, icy conditions, and mechanical problems, Amelia landed in a pasture at Colmore, north of Derry, Northern Ireland. The landing was witnessed by Cecil King and T. Sawyer. When a when a farm and asked, "Have you flown far?" Amelia replied, "From America." Being very proud of it. As the first woman to fly solo non-stop across the Atlantic, Earhart or Amelia Earhart received the Distinguished Flying Cross from Congress, the Cross of Knight of the Legion of Honor from the French government, and the Gold Medal of the National Geographic Society. Of course, by doing all this, her fame grew, and she developed friendship with many people in high offices, most uh, notably First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt. And there is going to be a conspiracy theory around this. Roosevelt uh, shared many of Amelia's interests and passions, and I think that's why they got along, especially women or women uh, causes after flying with Amelia. Um, Roosevelt obtained a student permit, but did not further pursue her plans to learn to fly. It was 
something that she did, but she didn't actually become uh, a pilot or became. The two friends communicated frequently throughout their lives. Another famous flyer, Jacqueline Co Cochran, who was considered to be Amelia's greatest rival by both the media and the public, also became a friend during this period. On January 11, 1935, Amelia became the first aviator to fly solo from Honolulu, Hawaii to Oakland, California. Although this transoceanic flight had been attempted by many others, but they always had some kind of problem uh, with the weather, with mechanical problems, but Amelia had a mainly routine flight with no mechanical breakdowns. And even in her final hours, she mentioned that she relaxed and listened to the broadcast of the Metropolitan Opera from New York. That same year, on April 19, she flew solo from L.A. to Mexico City. The next record attempt was a non-stop flight from Mexico City to New York. Setting off on May 8, her flight was uneventful. Between 1930 and 1935, Amelia had set seven women speed and distance aviation records in a variety of aircraft, including the Kinner Erster, Lockheed, Pika, and Pitcairn, uh, Otto, Carol, not sure. In, uh, by 1935, recognizing the limitations of her lovely red Vega in long transoceanic flights, Amelia knew that in order to continue her goals and aim for something bigger, she needed to change it for something different. So while Amelia was away on a speaking tour in late November 1934, a fire broke out at her residence and it destroyed many family treasures and Amelia's personal mementos. Following the fire, the couple decided to move to the West Coast where GP took his new position as head of the editorial board of Paramount Pictures in North Hollywood not bad. <laughs> While speaking in California in late 1934, Amelia had contacted Hollywood stunt pilot Bo Muntz in order to improve her flying, focusing especially on long-distance flying and wanted to move closer to him. So at Amelia's urging her husband, GP, he bought a small house in June 1935, close to the clubhouse of the Lakeside Golf Club in Toluca Lake, a San Fernando Valley celebrity enclave. It was like an enclosed community. Uh, and it was in between the Warner Brothers and Universal Pictures studio complex complexes where they had earlier rented a temporary resident. So Amelia was excited that she was moving closer to this stunt person and um, they decided that instead of moving right into the house they were going to remodel and try to make the house fit their needs since it was a smaller house. In 1935, Amelia joined the Purdue University as a visiting faculty member to counsel women on careers as a technical advisor to its department of aeronautics. Early in 1936, Amelia started planning around the world flight, that it's going to be a very famous flight. Although others have flown around the world, her flight, as I mentioned in the beginning, was going to be the longest, 29,000 miles or 47,000 kilometers, because it's followed a roughly equatorial route with financing from Purdue, which is the university that she was working with. In July 1936, a Lockheed Electra 10E was built at Lockheed Aircraft Company to her specifications, which included extensive modifications to the fuselage and incorporating many additional fuel tanks. Amelia dubbed the twin engine monoplane her flying laboratory, as she called it. The plane was built at Lockheed Burbank, uh, Burbank California plant, and after delivery, it was anchored it at uh, Mons. 
Airlines United Air Services, which was just across the airfield from the Lockheed plant. Amelia chose Captain Harry Manning as her navigator. He had been the captain of the President Roosevelt, the ship that had brought Amelia back from Europe in 1928. Manning was not only a navigator, but he was also a skilled radio operator who knew Morse code. Through contacts in the LA aviation community, Fred Noonan was subsequently chosen as a second navigator. He had vast experience in both marine, uh, which he was a licensed captain, and also flight navigation, and the original plans were for Noonan to navigate from Hawaii to Howland Island, a particularly difficult portion of the flight. Then Manning would continue with her heart to Australia, and she would proceed on her own for the remainder of the project. So, of course, this is not a non-stop flight, it's a around-the-world flight. So they were planning to have different navigators in different places so they can replace each other while she was still being the pilot. Now, on the next episode, we're going to talk about the flights. There was a first attempt, a second attempt, and we're also going to reveal what ended up happening to the aircraft. What happened to Amelia? The conspiracy theories. What I believe it happened. And hopefully you can share with me if you have any other theories on the next video. This was something very, very interesting to research. And I think it's a great example that we can have for us today, many, many years later. And it's not only that, having that education, that, or being raised believing that you can't do things, but also trying to think out of the normal. In this case, she was trying to beat men, but she was also very sneaky and tried to fit in. So she would get that opportunity. She never gave up. And she had to go through many struggles. She had to move throughout a high school, which nowadays it feels like whenever a parent had to move to a different place because money or whatever the case may be, it's almost like a punishment for the parents to move the kids to another high school. Well, she had to deal with all that. Homeschool, then public school then another school, then another school, then another state, then another state. And she managed to continue to believe. She was also always looking for programs and things that she could do. And I think that secretly she was trying to look those things that were always um, dominated by men. And she wanted to prove a point that maybe led her to be the woman that she was. I think that her marriage, her beliefs, and everything goes with what she lived as a child. The struggles her parents had, and maybe the unconventional way that she thought that marriage should work. But I believe that how she ended her life, or you know, how her life ended to all of us, it was just a reflection of somebody who was fearless, who knew exactly what they wanted out of their lives, and was willing to show the world that it was possible, that she wasn't crazy, that she was different, because she wanted to encourage other people to follow their dreams, if they were just about flying planes, even better, because she would help whatever organization that would promote this among uh, women. So, I think that, you know, she wasn't like a selfish person who was always thinking about herself and what she could achieve, what she could do next. But also, 
trying to set an example and promote Dreaming Big to other ladies around the world. And I feel like nowadays we have the celebrities that aboard zero to our lives. <laughs> Thanks again for watching and I will see you soon.